All right, so sample test for chapters four and five, as is usual. If it is not on the sample test, you don't need to know it for the test. Um, and so all you need to do is make sure that you know how to do everything on this sample test. Okay, so it says a town's population has been decreasing at a constant linear rate. Linear, of course, tells us it's a line. And it says in 2012, the population was 46,000. By 2017, the population was 43,250. So there's our two ordered pairs. Uh, remember, as we've talked about before, that the population depends on the year. So our year will be independent, the X value. Our population will be dependent, the Y value. All right, so we've got our two ordered pairs right there. So let's go ahead and find our slope. So slope is y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. So we're just going to take y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. And so there is our slope of negative 550. Now, if you'll notice, this portion is going to be on the part of the test that is with a graphing calculator. So you could use that program on your calculator, the ACT SAT and use the slope portion of that if you wanted to, or you can do it by hand, either way. All right, so now I have a slope, and I can choose either one of the points. This one looked like an easier one to me, um, but you can choose either one. doesn't make any difference. And so we're going to put in our negative 550 for our slope, and then we're going to put in our ordered pair. So we'll put in 46,000 for y, and we'll put in 2,012 for x, and that will enable us to solve for B, all right? So we'll multiply the negative 550 times 2012 and then add that to both sides and we'll get our B value. So if we take that and put it right in the place of B, then there is our linear equation, all right? Then the second thing it said was use your linear equation to predict the population in 2020, all right? So what is 2020, is it X or Y? X. Mm -hmm. So let's take 2020 and put it in the place of X right there. And then that will give us 41,600 for our Y value. Okay. All right. Look at the second one. All right. So for our second one, this you have to do on your graphing calculator. There's no other way to do it. So go ahead and grab your graphing calculator if you would, please. So this is obviously on the graphing calculator page. All right, so you'll notice that it says use the given table of information and then use the regression capabilities of your calculator to fit a line to the data. Okay, so here's the data that we're talking about. So we're on your calculator. If you will press your stat button, stat is statistics. All right, so when you press stat, it's going to look like this. All right, we also said it's a good habit to clear your lists, right? So we could come up here to list one and hit clear, enter, and it'll clear that whole list so you don't have to go through and clear it one by one, all right? Same idea, use your arrow key and arrow up here till you're sitting on top of list two and hit clear, enter, not delete, but clear, enter. It'll clear that whole list, okay? So go ahead and put your X values in list one and your Y values in list two, and I'll wait while you do that. Put your X values in list one and your Y values in list two. All right, so I'm gonna call those out to you to make sure that you've got them in there correctly. So double check if you would. It should be 115, 321, 432, 748, 953, 1280, okay? All right, so once you've got your points in there, you're gonna hit your stat button again. And this time you're going to go over to calculate. Now, they told us that this was linear. So you might remember that when we did this, um, we had to like, we went to stat plot and we plotted all the points just to make sure that it was a line. We don't have to do any of that because they've told us it's linear. Okay. So since I know it's linear, I'm going to choose linear regression. And when I choose linear regression, for your X value, it should do this by default, but let's just double check it. For your X value, it should say list one. For your Y value, it should say list two. 
You don't need to worry about storing the equation. So just go down to calculate and hit enter. So you can either hit enter a couple of times or you can scroll down and hit enter. And when you do, it's going to give you this screen. Now, yours may not have these R's down here. Don't worry about it. I have mine set a little differently because I teach statistics. It All you need is the A and the B. So if it doesn't have those R's, fine. That's just less to confuse you, right? So it said to round your answer to four decimal places. So we're going to round this off 5.7738 and 6.8571. So the 5.7738 is going to be my slope. That's going to go in for A. And the 6.8571 is going to be my y-intercept that's going to go in for B. So there's my equation right there. So one more time, statistics, put everything in list one and list two, then hit statistics again and go over to calculate. Choose option number four, linear regression. If you have it set today so that X is list one and Y is list two, you won't have to touch it tomorrow. All you'll have to do is just scroll down to calculate and hit enter, and it'll shoot that answer out for you, okay? So again, here's our slope, here's our Y-intercept, so there's our equation. All right, then the second thing it said was find F of X when X is equal to 17. So all I'm going to do is put 17 in the place of X right there, and then that will give me my Y value, all right? And again, um, this one. yes, we can't see your screen. Seriously? Hang on just a second. How about now? Can you see it now, ladies? Lauren and Beth. Yes. Yay! Yes, Woohoo! Okay. So, again, um, we went to um, statistics. We put the information in list one and list two. We went back to statistics and we chose calculate. And then we picked linear regression. Hit enter and it will tell you what your equation is. Here's your slope, here's your y-intercept. So slope, y-intercept. Okay, then once we had our equation, it asked us to, when x is equal to 17, to find y. And so we just put 17 in for x and that gave us our y value. And again, you can use your calculator to help you do your computations, okay? Questions about that one? All right, so let's look at number three. All right, so for number three, this is where we start dealing with our parabolas, and they want us to identify everything. They want the vertex, x and y intercepts, domain and range, axis symmetry, whether it's a maximum or minimum, and a graph, okay? So let's start with, if you're graphing, we usually want to start with the vertex, all right? So there are two different forms for a parabola. The first one is right here, ax squared plus bx plus c. The other one is down here, y is equal to ax minus h squared plus k in our next example, okay? So this one is the ax squared plus bx plus c. And in that form, I want to find my vertex by doing negative b over 2a. All right, what's b? Four. What's A? Two. So we're going to do negative four over two times two. So negative four over four would be negative one. All right. So if X is negative one, how do I find Y? Plug it in. So we're going to take negative one and plug it into the equation and we'll find Y. And so our vertex then would be negative one, two. So you can see right here where we plugged it in and got that two. So I'm going to go ahead and come up here to negative one, two, and plot my vertex. How do I know if this is gonna open up or down? The A, value. the A value, the leading coefficient. If it's positive, it opens up. If it's negative, it opens down. Ours was positive two, so it's gonna open up, all right? Why is that important? Because the next thing they asked me to find are the x-intercepts. Y'all, if I already know that this is my vertex and it's opening up, where is it gonna cross the x-axis? Nowhere. So then I don't waste my time doing all of this stuff down here if I already know that it doesn't have any x-intercepts, okay? X-intercepts are just where y is equal to zero, so you're just going to set your quadratic equal to zero, 
If it factors, fabulous, you can factor it. If not, you could do quadratic formula. So if you hadn't already picked up on the fact that there weren't going to be any x-intercepts from your graph, when you get to this point right here where you have the square root of a negative, what's the square root of a negative? Imaginary. You can't graph imaginaries, right? You can't have imaginary x-intercepts on your graph. So you could quit right there. I did go ahead and finish working it out so that you could see those solutions and see that they genuinely are imaginary and that you're not going to have any x-intercepts, okay? So no x-intercepts. All right, how do you find y-intercepts? Set x equal to 0, yes. So if we go through and we put 0 in the place of x and 0 in the place of x, we're really just going to end up with our c value, right? And so sure enough, down here, we put in 0 for each of the x's and we get our c value of 4. So we could go ahead and plot that 4 right there and that would really tell me everything I need to know about the parabola. I already knew its vertex. I knew it was opening up and now I know how steep to draw it because of the y-intercept. So when it says sketch, that's a sketch. I don't need six points on there or anything like that. That's perfectly fine as long as I can see the vertex, which way it opens, and how steep it is. Okay? All right, then the axis of symmetry. Remember, your axis of symmetry is going to run right down the center of your graph. And so it will always be x is equal to the h value of your vertex. So our h value of our vertex was negative 1. So that's going to be x equals negative 1. If this opens up, am I going to have a maximum or a minimum? Minimum, uh-huh. So if it opens up, I'm going to have a minimum at the vertex. If it opens down, I'm going to have a maximum at the vertex. All right, and then domain and range. Your domain is going to be all real numbers unless one of two things happens. You have a zero in the denominator or a negative under an even indexed radical. Do you have a denominator or an even indexed radical? No, you have polynomial, so your domain is going to be all real numbers. I actually think it's easier to find the range by looking at the graph. So since we've already graphed this, if we start down here, what is the first y value that we get to? Positive 2, right? And then it goes from 2 on up to infinity. All right? So then our range is going to be from 2 to infinity. Now, if you're more of a formula person, here's what you can do as well. If it opens up, it's always going to be the y value of your vertex to infinity. And if it opens down, it's always going to be negative infinity to the y value of your vertex. So if you'd rather a formula, that's fine. If you'd rather look at your graph and use common sense, that's fine as well. Okay, so that was the ax squared plus bx plus c form. This is standard form. y is equal to ax minus h squared plus k. That is standard form, sometimes called vertex form, because you literally can see your vertex hk right there. All right, so what is h going to be? If this is x minus h, what is h going to be? Negative 1. It's going to be the opposite of that number right there. All right. But if this is plus k, I'm not going to do the opposite of that number. I'm going to use it exactly as it is. So opposite of positive 1 is negative 1, but I keep that negative 4 exactly as it is. So my vertex would be negative 1, negative 4. All right. They also asked me if this is going to have a maximum or a minimum. So first off, which way does this open? Down. Down. How do we know? The a value is negative, right? So we had a negative a value. That means it opens down. So if it opens down, then do you have a maximum or a minimum? Yeah, you have a maximum, right? So again, if it opens down, you have a maximum. If it opens up, you have a minimum, okay? Now, one thing that I want to um, mention to you that came up in WebAssign. Um, I've had a couple of people ask me, about and so I want to make sure that um, you can that you understand what they're asking you. Let me make sure our ladies online can see here. Okay, so in WebAssign, one of the questions that they asked was um, to find the horizontal intercept. We have never called it that. We've always called it the x-intercept. And so one of the questions on there, it asks for the x-intercept, and then the next question, it asks for the horizontal intercept. And you're like, wait, what is that? 
So they're the same thing. It's two different names for the same thing. We've just not seen it called that before. Um, but again, if you had a horizontal axis and you had an intercept on it, that would be the x-intercept. Similarly, the vertical intercept would be the y-intercept, okay? And then there's also a question where they ask me um, to take a parabola that's in the ax squared plus bx plus c form and switch it to standard form, but they don't tell you what standard form is. This is your standard form. So basically, if we go back to that problem that we were just looking at, basically they would want me to take it from this form and express it in this form. In order to do that, all I need is an A, an H, and a K. So we already knew A up here was positive 2, and H... Footmark? Yes, ma'am? Yeah, Spencer Robichaux. Yes, ma'am? You need to see Ms. Bowers, please. Okay. Thank you. Um, so H would be negative 1, and K would be positive 2. All right? So if we had to switch it to that other form, that's all that we would need to do. All right, let's look at number four. Actually, number five, sorry. So for number five, they give us the exact same thing only in a word problem format, all right? So this is on the calculator page, your graphing calculator page, so you can choose how you want to do this, all right? But here is my equation, and they want to know um, how many should the company produce to maximize the profit and what is the maximum profit? Where does the maximum occur on a parabola? At the vertex, yeah. So we need to find the vertex. So I'm going to do negative B over 2A. So what's B? 100. And what's A? Negative 0.5. Yes, so we're going to do negative B over 2A, and that's going to give us 100. All right, so once you know your x value, how do you find your y value? Once you know x, how do you find y? Plug it in, yes. So we are going to plug in our 100, and we'll get 5,800. So there's our vertex, 100, 5,800. Which of those is my maximum, the x value or the y value? The maximum or the minimum is the y value, yes. So you're talking about like how high or how low something goes, right? So the maximum or the minimum is going to be the y value. So the x value tells me where that occurred or when that occurred or how many you had to sell in order for that to occur, okay? So for this one, when it says how many units should the company produce, that's the X value. And when it says what is the maximum profit, that's the Y value. So you can see we've given X for the first part and Y for the second part. All right, look at the next one. So for the next one, they give me a cubic equation and they want to know, does it start up or down? Does it end up or down? And um, find all the zeros of the function and then use that to sketch the graph. Okay, how do we know, what does the leading coefficient tell me? If the leading coefficient is positive, what does that tell me? It tells me how it ends. So it tells me it ends going up. So if my leading coefficient is positive, it tells me it ends going up. What if my leading coefficient was negative? It ends going down. Mm -hmm. All right, then if it has an odd degree, it starts and stops in opposite directions. If it has an even degree, it starts and stops in the same direction. So for us, we had a degree of three. That's odd. It's going to start and stop in opposite directions. So if it stopped going up, then it's going to start in the opposite direction. It's going to start going down. All right, if it's a degree of three, how many times should it turn? It should turn two, always one less. Mm -hmm. So this should start down, turn once, turn twice, and stop going up. I just don't know where to draw the thing. And so that's where the x-intercepts help me. So that's why they ask us to find the zeros of the function by factoring by grouping. So I'm going to group the first two terms and group the last two terms. Let's take out our greatest common factor out of these first two terms. 
and our greatest common factor out of the last two terms. So since they both have an x minus 5, pull that out. Remember, it's like you can put your finger over this and your finger over this, and what's left, the x squared minus 1, is your other factor. And so we'll get x is equal to 5 and x is equal to positive and negative 1. So x is equal to 5, x is equal to positive 1 and negative 1. So now I know where to draw that thing. So we knew what its shape was, but now we know where to draw it based on the solutions or the intercepts. All right, for 7, we're going to go the exact opposite way. So on number 6, they gave me the equation and asked me to find the solutions. For 7, they're going to give me the solutions and ask me to find the equation. All right, so the very first thing we need to do is take it from its solution form to its factor form. So if we back up for a second, back here when x was equal to 5, if we wanted to write that in its factor form, we wrote it as x minus 5. Basically, it's just set equal to 0. So we look at what does it take to make this equal 0. We'd subtract 5 from both sides in order for it to equal 0. All right, so same story over here. If I have x equals negative 5 and I want that to equal 0, I'm just going to add 5 to both sides. Same thing here. Add 2 to both sides. Subtract 1 from both sides. So there are our factors. All right, also in that last problem, again, kind of working our way backwards, we had our solution and then we had our factor. Notice we strung all of our factors equal together and set them equal to one zero. So let's do the same thing here. Let's take all three of these factors. Let's string them together and set them equal to one zero. Now the only thing that we need is just our leading coefficient a. And that's why they told me that my y-intercept is zero six. Because if I put 0 in for each of these x values, I should get 6 for my answer, for my y value. So notice then the only unknown that leaves is a. And so I can solve for a. So we can say 5 times 2 is 10, times negative 1 is negative 10. So we'll have negative 10a is equal to 6. Divide both sides by negative 10, and there's our leading coefficient, negative 3 fifths. So bring it right there, and we've got negative 3 fifths times each of those factors. You do not need to multiply that together. So you don't have to sit there and foil and distribute and put all that together. You can leave your answer exactly like that. It is perfectly fine. All right, example 8. I did mine by long division. Could you have done this by synthetic division? How do you know if you can use synthetic division? You have to be dividing by something in the form of what? x minus k. Mm -hmm. This is not x minus k. It's x squared minus k, right? You cannot use synthetic division on this. You have to use polynomial long division. Now, when we're doing the polynomial long division, don't forget that you have to fill in zeros for any missing terms. So this was x squared minus 1. That's x squared plus 0x minus 1. This was x cubed minus 4x. That's x cubed plus 0x squared minus 4x, and then a constant of 0. So it's not going to line up if we don't fill in zeros for all the missing terms. Okay? So our first step is to estimate how many times x squared goes into x cubed. So you can say x squared times what is x cubed, or you can say x cubed divided by x squared. Either one of those is going to give you x. All right, then we multiply. So x times x squared is x cubed. x times 0x is 0x squared. x times negative 1 is negative x. Then we subtract. And when you subtract, you change every sign. So it's going to be x cubed and a negative x cubed, so 0x cubed. 0x squared and a negative 0x squared is 0x squared. Negative 4x and a positive x is negative 3x. All right, then I bring down. And so the next thing I have to bring down is 0, and I start all over again. So I say, how many times does x squared go into negative 3x? Well, it can't. You can't say x squared times what is negative 3x or negative 3x divided by x squared. So I don't have anything left to bring down. That is my remainder. All right. So my solution would be x with a remainder of negative 3x, and we write our remainder over our divisor as a fraction. So we would have x plus a negative 3x over x squared minus 1, or you could just say x minus 3x over x squared minus 1. 
All right, now for number nine, we could use synthetic division because for this one, notice that we're dividing by x minus one. So we can use synthetic division, all right? So what's gonna go in my little box for the synthetic division? Negative one or positive one? Positive one, it is the opposite of that number, right? X minus K. So you can see we're gonna put a positive one in there. And then our coefficients across the top. And again, notice if you skip a term, you have to fill zero in for that term, okay? So we're gonna bring that first term straight down. So two times one goes in the next column. That would give us two. So negative four and two would be negative two. Then we repeat that same thing. Negative two times one goes in the next column, negative two. Zero and negative two is negative two. Negative two times one is negative two. Combine and we'll get positive three. Now, how do I know how to start labeling this? Like how do I know if it's two X to the second or the third or the first or the whatever? It's one less than the starting value. It is one less than the starting value because you're always dividing by x to the first. And so if you divide this by x to the first, it's always going to reduce it by one, right? So we would start with x to the second. So x to the second, x to the first, constant, and then remainder. Now, there's another way that we could find the remainder if that's all we wanted to know. Here's that exact same problem, okay? Same thing we were just working with. And they ask me, what's the remainder when you divide by x minus 1? Now, you could do synthetic division, but there's actually a faster way to do that. That was our remainder theorem that just said the same number that you put in the little box right here, that positive 1. If you just plug that into the function, the answer that you get will be your remainder. So you can see, sure enough, we got 3 up here and we got 3 down here. So if they just say to find the remainder, you can do it either of those ways, whichever you like better. Why would we just want to know the remainder? Because the remainder tells us whether what we were dividing by was a factor or not. What does the remainder have to be in order for it to be a factor? Zero. So if I get zero, it's a factor. If I don't get zero, it's not a factor. So for us, we didn't get zero, so it's not a factor. Okay, so either of those two methods that we want to use would give us the same thing. All right, then look at number 11. This is our favorite. So the whole P over Q thing. Please notice that this is on the graphing calculator page. And we're going to talk about some things that will help you um, because this is on the graphing calculator page. Okay, so the first thing I want to check is make sure this will not solve any other way. Like, if it can factor by grouping or something else, I definitely want to do it that way. I want this to be a last resort. That will not factor by grouping. So I'm going to find all the factors of my constant. We call those our p-values. And all the factors of my leading coefficient, we call those our q-values. And we're going to put all the p's over all the q's. That gives us our possible rational roots. Are all eight of those going to be roots? No, this is a degree of three, right? It can only have three solutions. So all eight of those are not going to be solutions. So I have to try them until I find one that gives me a remainder of zero. So I started off with positive one. You can start with anything you want to. I plugged in positive one. I plugged in negative one. I plugged in positive two and finally got a remainder of zero so that that meant that it was a factor. Now, if you have your graphing calculator, which you do for this problem. Remember that you could put this into y equals and graph it. What would you be looking for on your graph that would tell you which of these values you would want to use? Where it crosses the x-axis. Yes, where it crosses the x-axis. X-intercept, salute, uh, x-intercept, solution, root, zero, all the same thing, right? So when you graph this in your calculator, there is only going to be one x-intercept, and it's at positive two. So if you want to try values until you find one that works, you can. Or if you want to put it in your calculator and look at the graph and see what x-intercept it is, that would tell you, either case, what you want to do with your synthetic division, which value you want to start with. All right? So I'm going to do synthetic division with positive two. And then the resulting quadratic that I get is x squared minus 6x plus 13 again. This is on the calculator portion, right? 
I'm not assessing whether you can do, whether you can solve a quadratic. I've already assessed that. Throw that thing into the quadratic program on your calculator and let it shoot the answers out for you, okay? So our three solutions, don't forget about the two up here. That would be one of my solutions. And then these two imaginary solutions would give me all three of my actual roots or my actual solutions to that problem. Okay, then number 12 is our rational functions. All right, when you have a rational function, that just means it's a fraction. So they wanted us to find domain, range, asymptotes, intercepts, and a sketch of the graph. So let's go in the order that we did this in our notes, okay? In our notes, the first thing we did was find our x-intercept. x-intercept is where y equals zero. This is a fraction. The only way a fraction equals zero is if its numerator equals zero. So we said you could use the little shortcut of the numerator equaling zero. So we took our, norm, our numerator, 4x plus 2, and set it equal to zero. And that gave us our x-intercept. So there it is right there, negative 1 half. All right, y-intercept is just where x is equal to zero. So I'm going to put a zero right there and right there and right there. And so when I do, that will give me a negative two-fifths. So my y-intercept is right there at negative two-fifths. All right, asymptotes. Vertical asymptotes are where your denominator equals zero. So we took our quadratic and we factored it and we got negative five and positive one. So vertical asymptote at negative five and at positive one. Horizontal asymptote, we compare the degree of the numerator and the denominator. So the degree of the numerator was one and the degree of the denominator was two. So when the degree of the numerator is less than the degree of the denominator, it's y equals zero. What if the degree of the numerator equals the degree of the denominator? Like, what if this was 4x squared over x squared, and they were the same? 4x squared, leading coefficient of the numerator over leading coefficient. Yes, leading coefficient of the numerator, 4 over leading coefficient of the denominator, 1. Mm -hmm. And if the degree of the numerator is larger than the degree of the denominator, you do not have a horizontal asymptote. If it's one more, you'll have a slant asymptote. We'll talk about that in just a minute. All right. So, we also know that your domain is going to be all real numbers unless you have zero in the denominator or negative under an even indexed radical. So, we're going to say that our denominator cannot be equal to zero. Now, we had already factored that to be negative 5 and 1. So, we're just going to say all real numbers except for negative 5 and 1. And there is the interval notation for that as well. Now, range is easiest to find if you graph it. So, let's go ahead and graph this guy. We already have our horizontal and our vertical asymptotes, and we have our x and our y-intercept. Okay, so let's start over here. Please remember there will be a piece of your graph on both sides of the vertical asymptote. So I had nothing to work with over here. So I plotted a couple of points. I plotted negative 7 and negative 6. And once I got those two points, I know, okay, approaching an asymptote, approaching an asymptote. In here, I only had these two points. So I feel pretty good that this is going to approach that asymptote, but I don't really know what's going on over here. So I plotted a few points, like I put in negative 1 and negative 2, and then once I had those values, I could see that I was approaching the asymptote. Typically, your graph will approach the asymptote and not cross it, but it can cross it. If you'll notice, this crossed the horizontal asymptote, right? And it was not a problem at all because there was an intercept there. That was how I knew I had to do that. All right, and then over here for this piece, again, I just need a couple of values. So you can see I plotted like two and three. And once I connect those, approach the asymptote and approach the asymptote. So now that I have my graph, I can see this is going to negative infinity and this is going to positive infinity. So I know that my range would be all real numbers. It'd be negative infinity to positive infinity. All right, that slant asymptote thing that we were talking about, this is the exact same problem we worked in number eight, all right? We did polynomial long division in number eight, and we got x with a remainder of negative 3x. When the degree of your numerator is one more than the degree of your denominator, you'll have a slant asymptote. And again, the way you find that is just by long division. Throw out your remainder, and your slant asymptote will be y equals whatever your answer is, ignoring your remainder. All right, and then the last thing is the variation that we were just doing in our last section. 
All right, so for this one, you'll notice it says y varies directly with the square root of x and inversely with z cubed. Create an equation for the joint variation. Okay, so I know y is going to vary jointly with two different things. The first one is going to be directly with the square root of x. The second one is inversely. So remember, that means invert it, flip it inversely with z cubed. So there's my formula. Now I need to find k. I need to find my constant of proportionality. So plug in what they gave us. y is 15, x is 25, z is 1. So y is 15, x is 25, z is 1. And square root of 25 is 5. We'll get 5k over 1. Divide both sides by 5 and k is 3. So I'm going to come put 3 right here in the place of k. 3 right there in the place of k. There's my equation. Now it says, find what y is when x is 81 and z is 3. So I'm going to put 81 in for x and 3 in for z. 81 in for x, 3 in for z. And we'll get 1. They also gave us some of those in a word problem format. Okay, so here's one of those. It says, the distance the football travels is directly proportional to the amazingness that is Noah Chumley. Actually, it's just the speed of his kick. If the football travels 52 yards when the speed is 11, what's the speed when the ball travels 70? So what this said was the distance is directly proportional to the speed. Distance is directly proportional to the speed. Then it told me the football travels 52 yards. Is that distance or speed? Distance, uh huh. So we're gonna put 52 in for distance. When the speed is 11, we'll put 11 in for speed. And then I can find out my k value. So if I put k right here, then I've got distance is equal to k times s. Now I can answer the question they asked, what's the speed when the ball travels 70 yards? Am I putting 70 in for distance or speed? Distance, because 70 yards is the distance, right? And it says, what is the speed? So I'm going to put 70 in for the distance, and I'm going to solve for the speed. Okay?